as many of you know, Rita Mae Brown is a New York Times bestselling author, Emmy-nominated screenwriter, poet, activist, fox hunter, and animal rescue advocate, also animal rescuer. She has published more than 30 books of fiction and nonfiction, and her new novel, Kiss, Hiss of Death, is a Mrs. Murphy mystery. Born near the Mason-Dixon line, like we are here, in Hanover, Pennsylvania, she is actually a Virginian. After having lived in Pennsylvania, Florida, New York, D.C., and Hollywood, I believe it was after the Hollywood stint that she she bought her land in Virginia and settled in with her people, who happened to include any number of different animals at a particular time, many of whom she has rescued. She has been publishing since 1970s. I was thrilled to be asked to introduce her, but then realized I hadn't read any of her books in about 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> I was busy raising children, so I got very busy. I have to say that I don't usually read mysteries, unlike many of you. Don't really know why, but Rita May has me hooked now. <laughs> also, I'm very allergic to cats, <laughs> so I don't really like them. But if you've ever wondered what your animals are thinking or saying to each other or to you, as I do, then you will love Rita May's stories where the animals often figure things out before you do. On a personal note, I've just spent two days watching my daughter Elena graduate from the University of Maryland with two degrees, one in anthropology slash archaeology and also women's studies. She was the student speaker at the women's studies ceremony and it was really such a joy to hear her voice, by which I mean her voice. That is what she has to say. I don't know, since I've read, had Rita Mae on my brain, I thought of how Rita Mae has spent her life finding her voice and then using it, sometimes in ways that shook things up. And now, here's my daughter at 22, already with a voice, ready to tell those old white guys some truths. <laughs> some truths about women and what those little pieces of ceramic really mean. Turns out Rita Mae's recent book, Hiss of Death, is also about people and their voices, and animals finding and using their voices, and also, of course, about the mysteries surrounding unexplained deaths, yes, plural, about a woman dealing with breast cancer. It's also about politics and science and medicine. So it's not necessarily the cozy atmosphere that many of Rita Mae's readers are used to enjoying. But breast cancer, politics, science, and medicine are pretty real, and so is Rita Mae Brown. Please join me in welcoming her to Gaithersburg, Maryland. Rita Mae. Well, thank, I want to thank Gaithersburg for having this event, and of course you all for having such good literary taste. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. You know, um, whenever I used to talk to audiences, I would tell these political jokes to kind of warm up the audience, but I don't do it anymore because too many of them get elected. <laughs> and I've reached a point where I can't even talk about politics without getting Tourette's syndrome. <laughs> so instead, I will, f I will focus on the animals and on you. M my first question is, how many of you have a cat? <laughs> All right, how many of you have a dog? Does anyone have horses? All right, good. Um, What's interesting, I think, about where we are now, I grew up on a farm, but when I was born, half of Americans lived on farms, half lived in the city. Now, 90% live in the city and suburbs, and only 10% live on the farm. So an, a great deal of information is being lost. And maybe you haven't thought about it in these terms, but your animals are, are a connection to this other form of sensibility. Look at it this way. Any living creature on the earth is a winner. The losers are extinct. So each of these animals have what it needed to survive. And f before we became so urbanized, we needed that sensibility to live. Simple little example, those of you that have dogs. Okay, you take your dog on a leash, right? And perhaps there's parks here where you can let them off the leash. Um, and your dog, I know, is a good dog, so it doesn't run off. But what does it do? It runs up a few steps, stops, turns around, and looks at you. 
And you're thinking, well, isn't this exciting and wonderful? My dog is happy. Your dog is doing its job. Your dog is telling you up to that point it's safe. Goes to the next stop, keeps looking back at you. It's okay. You can come here. Your dog knows you can't smell. You have about 10 million set, sem, scent receptors. Your dog has about, there's an argument between Cornell and Auburn whether they have 110 million or they have 140 million, but the point is it's beyond our imagining. They can smell time. They don't need watches. Not only can they smell when the scent was laid down, they know what creatures intersected. They know if a stink bug, and by the way, I'm doing a big business in stink bugs, if anybody would like some. <laughs> I'll give them away for free. <laughs> but, I mean, they can tell if a stink bug crossed a rabbit, you know, if these two animals intersected, and what the nature of that crossing entailed. We haven't a clue. You could put a camera on each corner of a quarter acre. You would never know what your dog knows. And there was a time when we desperately needed that information to survive. None of us would really be here if it weren't for domesticated animals. We're very loath to admit that. But the truth is we needed them. And now we need them in a way to reconnect, if you're willing to do that. Because I think of the human animal as we're, since we're just talking to ourselves mostly, we're like in the spin cycle of a wash machine and we're just getting more and more neurotic. We need these other sensibilities t to literally ground us and to teach us how varied and extraordinary the world is. On some level, you all already know that. Uh, and, and, on, I'm, and I'm sure also I should say this because Sneaky Pie would be terribly upset if I didn't. Dogs have owners, cats have staff. <laughs> but that's part of the fun of it, isn't it? I mean, it really is. But uh, let, let me just leave off animals for one little minute here. What you all may or may not realize about yourselves is you're already part of an elite. Reading has always been an elite activity. Literacy is an extraordinary event which was not available to all Americans really until about the middle of the 19th century and then it was available to men, mostly white men, and then later it became available to African Americans and then later women. It was not taken for granted. Now yes, upper class white women could get an education, but literacy is still an elite activity. And you, you may not want to think of yourselves as an elite, but you are. And the differences between who, the number of people that read nonfiction and the number of people that read fiction is quite vast. Obviously, more people read nonfiction than read fiction. And that's fine. But you might ask yourself, why? Why is the number less with fiction? There are a couple reasons for that. Fiction, okay, nonfiction gives you the facts. Fiction, at some point, is trying to give you the emotional truth. Most people don't want to know that. It's too upsetting to enter into a realm where your emotions are, are truly engaged. Better to just blunt it and stick to the facts. So it takes a certain unusual kind of person to be willing to walk into that world, whether it's War and Peace, whether it's one of P.D. James's mysteries. There is, there's still stuff in there that is somewhat disquieting. And I always look at men who read fiction and think those are the toughest of all because they're willing to go where they're told not to tread. Oh, I'll handle that for you, honey. I mean, uh, well, I think, I think in some ways women pride themselves on being more emotionally alert than men. I'm not sure that's true, but I know the culture discourages it. So a man willing to read fiction is already willing to engage the world on a very different level than the guy who just wants the facts. Um, the people that read are the people that organize and run their communities. They're almost all involved in many activities. They reach out to others. They generally have fairly good social skills. Again, it's an elite. You can say, well, I don't feel like an elite. I don't think I'm better than other people. I'm not saying you're better. I'm just saying you're more involved in a way than others, and you're able to take the time to go through sequential thought. In other words, you're willing to look for cause and effect. There's now a generation that only knows sound bites. They only know images, and the eye is imprisoned by images because it's our primary s sense, unlike your hound or your dog, which the nose is the primary sense. So all any politician has to do, or demagogue, is show you a powerful image, and you're already hooked, in a way. Um, reading demands silence, quiet thought, and the willingness to go through the stages of either learning or peeling away your defenses to get to the raw emotion in the middle. So you're different. Whether you realize it or not, you're different.
And that doesn't mean you don't watch television. doesn't mean you don't like football. I won't go to the Redskins. Let's leave that. <laughs> Except to say one thing. How much have we paid for the best halfback? Any of your cats could smoke that sucker. <laughs> I want to know why our cats aren't paid that money. But once again, we measure everything by our senses, and our senses are really pretty pathetic. If you could jump to the ability of your cat from a standstill, you'd be able to jump to the top of a two-story building. I mean, we're slow, our teeth aren't good, we have no fangs, but we think we're really pretty terrific. And you know, th you know they're looking at you thinking, oh, God, the poor thing. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, I mean, really and truly. Um, but um, obviously, I, I don't know if they read or not. Uh, I, I, I know that they read over my shoulder, but what they're getting out of it, I don't know. But you're reading. So every time you pick up a book, whoever book it is, you've already entered another world. So your life has become the sum of all this information, just like your life has become the sum of all the lives of your friends, the lives of your children. I mean, so you're bigger and bigger and bigger. That's why you are so necessary. I said I wasn't going to talk about politics, but I will the time. You are so necessary for the future of our country because you are already looking at issues from a longer view and perhaps from a less emotional view. So I just leave you with that thought and hope that you don't back off because it's become so punitive. Um, they don't want you there. That's why it's so ugly. So you have to get back in there and, and just do what you can. Well, I don't care whether you're from the left, right, or center, but I will let you know Sneaky is going to run for president. Her motto is, I can't do any worse. And the other thing, no sex scandals. She's neutered. This is your candidate. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I, I, I didn't mean to rattle on there, but, but it is kind of fun. And it's so much fun for an author to be with readers, truly and, 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 and ever. Um, people say, oh, well, people don't read them. Of course they do. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you read on a Kindle or whatever. You're reading. You're using your mind. Um, you're entering other realities and learning a lot from it. Um, and if I could recommend a nonfiction book, The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. This is a fabulous book. There's so, many, there's so much good work out there, you really don't know where to turn. You know, like The Manhunt, they've actually got the book over in the, the tent, The Manhunt for John Wilkes Booth. And I have been on that farm uh, where he was shot. It's, it's eerie. You can still feel something there. Maybe that's just me. I'm overly imaginative. But... Um, there's just terrific stuff being done out there, and terrific fiction, too. So you, 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 can't, you can't lose. It doesn't. I mean, let me put it this way. If, if you don't like my books, okay, there's so many books out there. Find one you like. And then if you really want to test yourself, try to write one. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is when you run into the limits <laughs> of yourself. Of course, the cat has no limits. I just do what she tells me. So I can't take any credit for that. But again, I, I thank you, and if you all want to ask questions, or if anyone here would wish to give a confession, all literature started as gossip. I'm very happy to take it. Think of the first chapter of War and Peace, Endless Gossip, in that salon at St. Petersburg. Now, I know that not everybody here walks on water, so we're, we will all forgive you. <laughs> or as Mama said, oh, honey, good girls go to heaven, but bad girls go everywhere. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, the warmth. I think it's the warmth of other suns or the warmth of distant suns by Isabel Wilkerson. Is that it? Other suns? It's a really remarkable book. Um, and, and again, um, the, the one about the manhunt for John Wilkes Booth is really good. And um, I, I don't know about you, but I'm a promiscuous reader. I mean, just put a book in front of me and I'll pick it up and read it. Doesn't, doesn't matter what it is. Um, and there's, again, there's so much good work. There's so much good historical fiction out there, too, which is sort of a painless way to learn. Um, and you realize that our ancestors were not politically correct. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I'm thinking about what you said about reading being an elite uh, opportunity and we're an opportunity of the elite. And I'm thinking about some of the folks that I work with who go from a nursing home job to a group home job and they are literally working, you know, 16 hours every day and then they, they hope to have a weekend gig as well. Right. Right. And I'm um, just thinking about the multitasking and how it might be different to listen while you're doing a couple of other things, you know, and then maybe getting dinner ready. And, right. And, and what is that? How is that different? How is that? 
I don't know if it's if you're talking about people listening to books on tape or whatever it is who don't, don't really have the time to sit down and read. Um, I think a lot of it would probably depend on the ability of the reader, the, the ability of the person telling the story. How many of you listen to books on tape, by the way? Isn't it an incredible thing on a long trip or even a short one? Um, but you, you learn a lot. The, la the last one I listened to was Founding Mothers. I think that was, a, that was pretty interesting. Um, and to set, I've never listened to Sneaky's books on tape. Don't tell her that. But, but, but yeah, an auditory experience is different than a visual experience. Uh, but still, it, it is an experience. And by the way, speaking of senses, as you know, your ears are not as good as your cat or your dogs. The reason being is your ears are flat against your head. Theirs are developed to cup sound and draw it in so they can hear long before you do. I mean, they have a greater ability, but they also can catch the sound before we can. So if they notice something, pay attention. The other quick thing I'll say before, I know you had a question. Um, if you ever bring anyone into your house and your cat or dog doesn't like them, trust your animal. They'll smell something you don't get. I mean, truly, trust your animal. Yes, sir. They are. I wonder if that has a bit of a, a kind of a source of strength and uh, intellectual strength for women, the fact that they were encouraged. He's talking about young girls are encouraged to keep journals, and then you go into the bookstores, and most of the, the little diaries in the journals are somewhat feminine in their uh, look. Have you seen the one, the pink one, which is um, eat a cupcake? and life will get better. And then there's one with the, the crown of the Queen of England. Um, what, I forget what it's called, just don't, something like don't pay attention but carry on. But yeah, they're, they're, all de they're all designed to appeal to females. And I think it's better, but I, I may be wrong about this. Some of you m are educators and would know better than I do, but it would appear that the female brain is able to handle language before the male brain. Have a, who knows why? Um, uh, but then men catch up pretty quickly. I, I'm always very suspicious of gender studies. I feel that all gender studies and race studies are in the service of power, so you'll have to forgive my suspicion. But when I was in grade school, we were taught conclusively by the IQ scores that blacks were not as intelligent as whites. My suspicion was developed very early. So whenever there's a gender study, like testosterone, which is the new poison, have you ever noticed whenever anything goes wrong, it's testosterone poisoning? I just think it's all bullshit in plain words. I mean, really. I don't care who you are. I, I don't care what gender you are. You're responsible. That's just it. You're responsible. Um, and to make excuses for people just doesn't work for me. Um, whining doesn't work either. So clearly, I'm out of step with our time. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Right. <laughs> uh, talking about the, the the loss of linguistic ability because people don't write letters anymore. Well, whoever read the collected phone calls of Gertrude B. B. Stein, or who will read the collected inter internet or emails of so and so down the road? I don't know. Hopefully, they'll get out of it. But it, will it change our language? Sure, it will. Um, English will probably become more quick, we'll lose our subordinate clauses. Well, for instance, when I was in school, you had to take at least two years of Latin to get, to get into liberal arts in college. There was, no, there was no argument about that. Two years of Latin. Well, I went all the way through. I was a classics major, obviously. And I noticed a big difference between people who had Latin and people who don't. The faculty with language is much stronger. 60% of our language is Latin. We are the only language that has a blood knot. Two completely different structures an inflected language with his Latin, which if you all haven't had Latin or French or whatever, I can say man bites dog in word order in Latin, but it still means dog bites man because it's inflected. It's like an earring. You stick this earring on and you know the, the part of speech it is. So it gives you incredible flexibility, which you don't have in English. English is almost architectonic. You have to do it in a certain order or it loses meaning. So in 1066, when Harold got the arrow in the eye, you get this inflected language, which was I think of as lazy Latin, which was Norman French, married to Anglo-Saxon. 
No language has what we have, which these two antithetical systems married into this extraordinary language, which truly is the mightiest language in the world. We have conquered the world, our language has. You can say, you can say things in English that are extraordinary. You can, you can take the most complex technological information and simplify it. The international language of aviation is English. Boom. Direct object. You know right away what's going on. It's so quick. But you can also have these languid, long things. I mean, pick up Charles Dickens. You know, it's, it's an amazing, amazing language. But will we lose these, uh, this nuance, this ability? I don't know. I don't know. But um, I, I mean, I'm actually, I, I still think young people should write proper thank you notes, don't you? <laughs> and I think you beat their butt with a wooden spoon if they don't. You know, write your grandmother or whatever. Um, but I have learned, I don't know if this is happening in Maryland, but in Virginia, they're not teaching penmanship anymore. Is that happening here? Oh, my God. Do you? I mean, do you remember sitting down there and laboriously trying to make those A's and W's and V's? I mean, what are they going to do? I don't know. I mean, what are they going to do when the batteries all die in these machines? <laughs> oh, well, maybe best not to go there. Yes, ma'am. I never really think about it. I'm sorry to say, I just do it. Um, but our whole society has changed. I mean, I grew up when blacks sat on the back of the bus and there were separate drinking fountains, when nobody would ever admit to being homosexual. They'd lose their job, they'd lose their children, they'd lose everything. You know, they'd be thrown out of their families. Um, and, and I saw people in, in the 70s whose lovers were dying and they couldn't visit them in the hospital because the blood family refused the lover visitation rights. I mean, uh, those of us who lived through those times saw very painful times. People suffered greatly. Um, things are better now. I wouldn't say they're terrific. You know, there's always going to be a certain prejudice. And this is the thing about the right wing. You know, have you ever considered why all the hot button issues are out there, quote, hot button, abortion, gay marriage, whatever you want to... I, I, there's this nasty little part of me that suspects if you're paying attention to those issues, you aren't l really looking at Wall Street or Washington. You're not looking at the fundamental issues. So e even though some of those issues directly affect me, I refuse to be diverted by them. I want to know where the money's going. I want to know about the tax dollar. I want to know about Obamacare. I want to know how many people are dying every day in Iraq and, and uh, Afghanistan. Uh, I want to know what is our commitment there. Are we going to stay there? Are we going to pull out? I'm not ar arguing with being there at this moment. I just want the facts. I don't want to be diverted by this stuff. The other thing, and this really is hateful. Oh, God. <laughs> but when I look at these right-wing preachers, I want to know if God is so smart, why doesn't he hire better help? <laughs> it can shake a girl's faith for a moment or two, you know. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I, I, I know. Are you still speaking to me? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Warrington is a fascinating little town. Vi Viola Windmill, one of the one of the leading lights of Warrington, who was a, a, a passionate fox hunter and. A, a, a lady of some means and tyrannical at times. <laughs> I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind using Viola. Warrington is still Warrington. They'll never change. I don't know if y'all ever been there. It's actually a very pretty little town, and it has the best tack shop in America, Horse Country, run by Marion Maggiolo. Where you go, and you can immediately feel your credit card start to melt. <laughs> I mean, and they have beautiful things. You don't have to ride. They have china. They have all this kind of incredible stuff, and I just have to avert my eyes. <laughs> You know, uh, yes, ma'am. I am actually. Um, uh, they don't sell as well as the others. They sell about half as many. But I love them so much, and I love Sister Jane. She's a character who means a lot to me because you all may have not read any of the fox hunting series, but she lost her son when he was 14. And I think anybody that loses a child and can still find beauty in life and reach out to others is a remarkable person. And she's that person. 
And uh, I mean, it's not all that obvious in the books. It's mentioned every now and then how Raymond died in a tractor accident and he got tied up in the PTO. Uh, but th those kind of people just amaze and fascinate me, and she's one of them. Plus, she's, she's a tough broad. Most fox hunters are. And I'm sure, as you know, we don't kill foxes, we just chase them. It's very different than in England, and I'm not putting the English down. Their agricultural practices are different. And as you know, one of the greatest hunts in America is here, Green Spring Valley, which was the hunt my mother used to hunt with. But it's, a, it's unchanged, how they have managed to preserve that. So close to Baltimore, I don't know, but it's really a fabulous hunt. And sometimes you'll wind up on the Maryland uh, Hunt Cup course. They will. I haven't been there yet. That's when you reach for your rosary beads. Hail Mary. <laughs> Those are thou amongst women. Those are big jumps, honey. You know, people, I remember one time when I was hunting, and I hunt the hounds myself, and I came back to the tailgate, and there was, a, there was a f the family there whose daughter had hunted for the first time, just this cute kid, and they said, did, did you hear Tally Ho? She said, no, but I heard oh shit a lot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes, ma'am. Well, I, I couldn't tell you all the names. There's a lot of barn cats, but the chief barn cat is Bibi, who keeps everyone else in line. And then in the house, there's about there's um, Pewter number two, who's 24, and there's Sneaky Pie number two, who's about 18. And then there's just a bunch of these little gray kittens who appeared. They always seem to appear. And and one is called Button because she just looks like a little button. But it, the cats just come in and out of the house of the barns of the life. You just feed, feed who's ever there, and I try to trap them and get them fixed. Obviously, I was not successful with Button's mother. <laughs> but um, and then there's all the rescued dogs and all this and that. It's fun. I, I for for those of you when I have 70 foxhounds, and the club helps pay to feed them. And then I have a pack of bassets which I hunt on foot. There's about oh probably about eight couple. Well, 16 of those. Hounds are always measured in couples. If you look at the pyramids and you'll see those beautiful friezes on the pyramids, you'll often see a slave with an iron ring and two pieces of leather going off the iron ring and salukis at the end of the iron ring. Well, for 5,000 years, hounds have been measured in couples. We've, we've never lost it. So I really have 35 couple of foxhounds. I have eight couple of bassets, etc. And it's great. I, l I just live with hounds. I fox hunted in my mother's womb, but I don't remember it. But it's all I ever really want to do. I mean, I know I should stay here and, and pass myself off as some highly intelligent person. I'm not. I'm just a fool that wants to hunt hounds. I mean, if you got a coon hound, I'll go out with you. I just think it's the best thing in the world, you know? But I love seeing nature. You can't go out there and not, and not be moved at what you see and how everything fits together and figure out that maybe you're not the crown of creation, you know? That's that. Anyway. I think I have to go sign. God bless you all for sitting here and for coming. It's a wonderful festival. Thank you so much.